your inner child, the best parent to your inner child is you, not your parents. Because what you want from your parents, and this is for me, you, and everybody listening in, they're likely not going to give it to you. You and I have talked for a while about making this happen. Mm -hmm. And I've been keeping tabs on the the work that you do, which is super important, super incredible. Um, Sarah, welcome to the Jens Talk Podcast. Thank you. The POC therapist, as you're Mm -hmm. commonly known as. POC, I presume, is person of color. You got it. Yeah. Um, See, I am smart. Um, Why does that part matter? I think it matters because when you look at any kind of practices that have been in the mental health space or actually just the mental health space there's not a lot of us and even now over the last decade there's been a lot of changes but if you still look around there's not a lot of people who look like me Hmm. so you'll see diversity but it's tough to see hyper visible minorities available there practices a lot of practices to continue to be heavily western and uh, rooted in western traditions which don't necessarily work and i think the most common thing we hear from people Listen, I'm looking for somebody who gets it because if there's one more person who says, you just got to move out or cut your parents off, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I think, the the misnomer. People don't seem to comprehend. There's different cultural yeah. considerations that don't always shine through yeah. in an obvious way. Yeah. Um, given your work in this space, how long have you been doing this now? I think over a decade. You're going to age okay. me here. <laughs> we'll go so, with the young. I'm 22. so <laughs> Absolutely. 21. <laughs> now legal in a yes. lot of places. Um, in the decade, have you seen improvements in the mental health space for mm-hmm. persons of color? Yes, I have seen substantial improvement over the last five to seven years. I think COVID was a big factor. It really just like pushed a lot of mental health issues to the surface. A lot of companies started increasing their mental health budgets as a means to attract top talent as well. Um, A lot of, uh, well, the whole BLM movement in summer of 2020 was I think also very, very substantial in bringing people, like making sure that companies are aware of this. A lot of spaces are aware of this and talk about and prioritize mental health. Mental health is much more of a common conversation that's come up now. In some industries, it's still a little bit taboo because, you know, it's career suicide if you go on short-term disability, if you're Hmm. perhaps in like, you know, the legal space, if you're in banking perhaps. But it is getting much more, more common over the last few years I've seen. When I first started out, I was at a hospital and uh, I used to be the person that they used to go to often because I was the only one who looked like me. I was actually the only person of color. Forget this hijab in my head. And they could spot me at the window. They were like, she's walking right over there. Go get her. Because we have a (laughs) client who, you know, I feel like might not be comfortable talking to me. Can she come in to talk? So even if I didn't speak that their language, the client's language, they were just comfortable having a person of color in the room with them. So they didn't feel as though they were being stripped away from things that were, their values that were important to them. And so to answer your question, the short answer is yes. And I'm happy to see it. It's not enough, but it's a start. Is there, actually, you know what? Before I jump into that, what more is needed? When you say it's not enough. Yeah, I think there needs to be, well, let me backtrack. As a student, I remember reading my textbooks and looking at a lot of the journals and articles. And I was like, there's no way I'm using that stuff. No way. Because I'm thinking about it for myself. And frankly, that's why I kind of got into the profession because I was looking for somebody like me when I was younger. So I was like, no, 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 no. If a therapist told me, I'm walking out. I was like, no, no, no. This is honestly not going to apply to me. Um, And so I'm not going to follow these rules. And I'm kind of going to like mishmash a couple of things and make my own way of doing things. And I saw how successful that became Mm. and how much needed it was. The reason why I was successful is because it was just a needed service. People needed intersectionality. There was a lot of like, like I say, Western principles don't necessarily apply. People not being diagnosed appropriately. The other thing also is it can lead to a lot of um, misdiagnosis, not being aware. So a lot of times we would hear anybody who would go to the ER, they would say, oh, you know, she's an immigrant. Like she's just adapting to the culture. That's why she's having a tough time. 
But no, there's underlying issues there that were being ignored. So I think we need a lot more education. Um, does it matter what area? I still have family doctors to this date, clients, family doctors who say, you don't have any problems, real problems. You don't need medication for anxiety. It's fine. You know, you have a job, you've got kids. It's fine. It's okay. Like everybody fights, everybody gets upset, but they don't think about it as a way to like improve quality of life. So education is required on a lot of levels on like the highest of the high levels where you're going to your physician as a care provider or just, you know, when we see police brutality, it's like the most common thing we see over and over again. And they're not mental health informed. So we need that. We need resources in the sense that we do need people of color. If you look at the population, look, step outside here. Most people look like you and me, you mm. know. But if you look inside the psychotherapy spaces, most people don't look like you and me. So then what happens is if you don't look, there's a huge mismatch that's there. And you're not providing your, you're not providing your community the needs it requires which will obviously have an economic impact on a larger scale. But I guess people are not looking at that. And that's when you see hospital numbers are going up. You know, people are accessing Emerge more because they don't know what to do. They don't know what else to, where else to turn to. And if you've just ignored something for such a long period of time, eventually it's going to catch up to you, right? Mm. The body speaks to you in volumes. And the way we're all designed is your body will have pretty similar responses. So if it's burnt out over and over and over, you will probably at some point experience maybe a panic attack, maybe some sort of medical health concerns, maybe develop hypertension at a young age. And you might find friends of yours that you know yourself who are young and you'd be like, dude, you're way too young to have that. What's going on? There's probably something going on underneath there that they're not aware of. They haven't been guided in the right direction. So we do need a lot more people that look like you and me. You can't have something on the outside that's not represented on the inside in these spaces. Right. Is there... So I, I, I'm going to ask, I'm gonna play devil's advocate for a moment. Hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, being the expert. If two people are going in for support for anxiety, let's uh -huh. say, how does the treatment differ between a person of color and a person who's not of color? Like in, mm -hmm. my initial yeah. thought is you're treating anxiety. I'm, I understand there has to be a level of uncovering cultural norms and biases yep. and all that underlying yeah. things that exist there. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you're working towards curing anxiety yeah. in this example. Yes. Is it that <clears throat> much different between person A and person B? Yeah. Because the first question I would ask is, what is the reason for that anxiety that's there? Right. Right. There's a lot of environmental factors that are in play. So let's say it's you. What's your background? I'm from Lebanon. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. So it's probably going to be a difficult conversation you might have with your mom who has no idea of perhaps any kind of mental health related issues. I'm assuming she grew up in Lebanon. Yeah, she grew up in a war. Oh, yeah. So yeah. then, you know, there's a lot of stuff her body's gone through and her bones and genetic system actually remembers because it's likely that her mom and her mom also experienced that. So it gets passed down. And that's called intergenerational trauma. And it's very likely that you also probably carry some of that in your body. Now, does that mean that, you know what, you're screwed? Yeah, if you don't do nothing about it, yeah, you probably are. But if you do something about it, mm. no, there's ways to maintain a very healthy lifestyle. It's like saying your mom's got diabetes, grandma had it, grand great grandma had it. Are you going to have it? Yeah, you could. But if you maintain your lifestyle a certain type of way and you have a specific type of diet, you are at a higher risk. Being at a higher risk is different from guaranteed you're screwed, hmm. right? Similarly as well. Um, a friend, I consider her to be a friend and a colleague in the community, Mariel Bouquet. She came out with a book and it's called Breaking the Cycle. That's specifically what she's referring to. And she talks about how it can go up to seven generations passed down in the uh, in the genes. That's a lot of generations. Yeah. And you know what? That's why you're just like, how is it that? Everybody's so messed up in my family. And, you know, how many times we hear our friends say, no, nah, man, you don't know. My family's like really messed up. Yeah. And, and then it's the, it's the Olympics. It's a trauma Olympics, right? Because no, no, no. You don't know what my uncle did. Let me tell you this story. And then it's somebody else is like, no, my aunt, hold on, you know? So it's just these stories start getting shared and you're just like, whoa, what's going on? But then that speaks to specifically to the environment that they grew up in. Mm. So I'm sure if your mom, you know, Maybe she's able to have those conversations with you. A lot of times the body shuts down and represses those memories because it's so difficult to bring it up and not having the tools or resources to process it. 
you don't know what to do. It goes into overdrive, so it just shuts down mm -hmm. a lot of times. So if it was you and your mom versus a friend of yours who kind of grew up over here, let's say, you know, um, Canadian or, yeah, let's just say Canadian, it's probably easy for your friend, George, let's call him, to have a conversation with George's mom compared to you and your mom because your mom's likely not going to understand it to the depth of the way George's mom will. You probably will be able to not create some boundaries with your parents the way George would. And that's what makes it very different. Because when you can't create boundaries or you don't have the skills to because it's enmeshed with so much guilt and shame that also comes with it because we're a family unit. We don't leave our own. We, we are all we have. And somebody else can do that and you're like, oh, it must be nice that you have that distance and you you can move out. Oh my God, I wish I could move out, but I don't have good enough reason. Mm -hmm. that, if I tell you that, you'd be like, yeah. Or you might be like, you moved out as a girl alone? What? How'd you pull that off? <laughs> you'd be shocked, right? But if Melissa told you that, would you ask her anything? No. You wouldn't. Yeah. Those things do play, pay, play a huge Subconsciously, role. Subconsciously too. Because we're not looking to sever those relationships. They're very meaningful relationships. But on the flip side to it, we also assume, no, we also experience a lot of pain from those relationships, a lot of times being unintentional. Because m many, most immigrant kids will tell you their parents love them very deeply. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to show that. Mm -mm. I think you can relate to that from the smirk on your face. <laughs> <laughs> I can too. Mm. I think most can. I think they did the best they could. Yeah. But you hear that. Most people will say something like that. They did the best they could. And, you know, you say that as a means to make yourself feel a little bit better. A little bit, yeah. But then what do you do when they say something tomorrow that pisses you off? You know, like, what did I tell you about that hair? <laughs> you look like a clown. And you're like, oh, uh, she's doing the best she can. Just take a deep breath. <laughs> but yeah. where do you go? Because you're going in the bedroom next to her and you're just like, I can't escape. Man, what do I do? That that was my childhood. Yeah. Um, my parents worked tirelessly. And... My father and my mother grew up in a in a civil war, mm -hmm. and my father lost his father. Didn't really have that male role model around mm -hmm. him, and so his relationship with me. My father tells me he loves me. My father and I have a great relationship. When it's good, it's great. Mm -hmm. But we butt heads so much mm -hmm. growing up, mm -hmm. and I would get mad at him mm -hmm. because I couldn't understand why he was so tunnel visioned on mm -hmm. so many things and as i get older i realize he also just didn't know what he didn't know because mm -hmm. he didn't have the luxury of having someone to show him mm -hmm. right so he just kind of learned as he went mm -hmm. um but the idea that that suffocating feeling at times existed yeah or i'm just i need to get out i can't be here yeah um and and i almost feel guilty saying that <laughs> funny enough welcome to a session my friend yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'll send you the bill <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 interesting because there are there were moments where i felt guilty there's still moments today where if my yeah. you know my parents ask me to do something or we get into a disagreement and i just get so mad yeah and then i'm like well i'm getting mad they're getting older they need my help yeah why am i getting mad yeah but it's a very interesting dynamic and a very interesting relationship that we have with our parents now, what would you say if a therapist told you you need some distance, you need to not see your parents or speak to them as much? I think I've intentionally been doing that. Uh, and there's moments where I feel guilty about doing that. But I knew that there was no way I can build myself in that environment. Mm -hmm. I needed to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily, there was a, an opportunity to move out and the whole shebang and, and whatnot. But... Um, I find myself now as I'm getting older and they're getting older and their reliance on me. It's funny, the reliance that I used to have on them has now flipped completely, right? Yeah. Um, but that I'm spending more time helping them with things as they're getting older. But it's not that simple because even though they're at your mercy for a lot of things, they still pull the trump card on you being like, yeah, I need you to do this for me because without you, I can't have it done. But don't forget, I'm still your parent. So I'm going to call the <laughs> shots. And you're like, 100%. But, yeah. but I'm paying. But I'm this. But And they're like, and? No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, a part of me is also like, you probably have earned that right. Yeah. I mean, considering what you have to do to come here and even give me an opportunity to yeah. say these words back yeah. to you. Um. I'll bite my tongue. Yeah. I'll take it. 
Yeah. But that requires a certain level of awareness, yes. certain level of skill set, and certain level of regulation. And a lot of people don't have that. How old were you when you moved here? Uh, to Canada? Mm -hmm. I was six months old. Okay, so very young. Yeah. But what happens is when you grow up in a traditional household where parents kind of hold on so tight because they also feel a sense of betrayal leaving their countries, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And they want to hold on to every aspect of every, you know, ounce of culture. Do you speak Arabic? Uh, yeah, casually. Yeah. 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 So it's like hammering it in because we left, so there's that guilt comes. And then there's the fear of we're going to lose everything. Yeah. We came here, so we got to hammer in the, I'm fluent in Urdu, I can read, write, Urdu, Hindi, all of that. Because of that, mm -hmm. they really hammered it in. And I'm very happy about it because, you know, when my friend's kids who are around, if they're Pakistani or Indian, I speak to them in Urdu. Yeah. Even when they have pets, I like say things to their pets in Urdu, <laughs> and, and, you know, because I like that part of my culture. Right. So when you have that, but then you've grown up here and most people around you have a very different type of lifestyle. That's where we run into so many issues, kids like you and me, because you're just like, but I grew up so heavily in this cultural household. And you start to almost um, despise certain aspects of it because we have this this thing called internalized colonialism where we're taught that the white man's way is the right way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the joke. Uh, one of my really good friends, Christina, she's Italian, and I'm like, of course, Christina always said is right. White is always right. <laughs> and she's like, stop it, stop it. You make me so uncomfortable. <laughs> and, you know, you probably picked up on it. Making people uncomfortable is something I love doing. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you did it as soon as you walked in. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my talents, one of my many useless talents. <laughs> so, you know, that's something that we start to reject. We start to really reject on how ourselves, our bodies, girls start dyeing their hair. We wear contacts to change our eye colors because mm. we don't like who we are. And when you grow up here, you're re you really internalize that even more, especially back in, you know, 80s, 90s. You're just like, not a lot of us who look like us. So you're just like, I'll do whatever I can to blend in. But if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because who wants to stick out like a sore thumb? But then how do you blend that with what your mom, mom is saying to you in Arabic? Hmm. You're like, don't pack the garlic sauce. Yep. I love the garlic sauce. But no, I don't love the garlic bread because they eat boiled chicken, ma. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what we're going to go with. And your mom's going to be like, it's not good. Yeah. But you're just like, well, chicken it it's is. It's like a clash of civilizations happening in your it everyday is. life. Yeah. But at 12, you don't care about that. What you care about is you want to belong. Mm. And when you don't belong and you don't feel like you belong, what's going to happen? You feel isolated impacts your self-esteem how do you recover from something like that because i think a lot of us have carried that exact issue yeah and the self-awareness piece is important but mm -hmm. you made a point not a lot of us are self-aware yeah that carries with us and that colors all of our relationships yeah. all of our interactions yeah. how do you firstly how do you become self-aware some you of know, us are fortunate you just yeah. stumble into a situation yeah. and suddenly you're like i do this yeah but for a lot of people, that self-awareness doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. You know, this might be a not so popular opinion, but I do hold, uh, like, I do very much hold, stand by this opinion of mine, which is I don't think North, North America or the lifestyle in North America is one that fosters self-awareness. It's n neither one that helps you, you know, get basic groceries and pay rent either. <laughs> yeah, but that's well, a separate problem yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but if you think about it, when you are your busy schedule is glorified when you mm -hmm. have six thousand things on your plate and you're just hustling with your fourth side hustle and you're making a dollar here and there and there and there and that is celebrated and then they want you to take that money and spend it on stupid things that you don't really need but it's just nice to flex those things how do you even have a minute to sit to just catch up with your body before a healthy issue pops up and tells you pump the brakes you need to slow down Mm -hmm. relax one of the biggest things we see in couples therapy is the fact that couples don't have time for each other they're both doing great power couple we love this idea he's a lawyer she's a doctor we're doing this 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 and then you know what any chance we get we book a flight four-day vacation to here to their exotic places we love seeing these things on the instagram and we're just me i'm like where is this this is beautiful too and then i have to pump the brakes to be like whoa relax what are you doing because it's so easy to subscribe to that mm -hmm. and i'm like i want a slice of that life but i don't and, and I've actually had to work really hard as a woman because there's certain things that were, you know, I feel like they were built into me. 
I couldn't even show up here with empty handed. No, you, you know? showed up with a, a box of cookies, I, I which was to. very sweet of you, by you, the way. You're kind. I had to, because then I would have been like, oh my God, I hear my mom's voice in the back. <laughs> and my sister's like, you're so rude. What's wrong with you? How could you? He's like one of us. See, all sorts of things would popped up, even if you weren't, you know what I mean? But it doesn't matter. Like there's things that are wired into us. Mm-hmm. And like you need to be able to pause and reflect and understand. And what people don't realize is you need actually time to do nothing. That's a big one. What's everybody? Oh, that's so boring. I struggle with that one. I feel like time. If so, if I'm, (laughs) if I'm sitting there and I'm not doing anything, I start to get antsy. Like I need to be doing something. Yeah. I need to either be working or learning something or listening to a podcast or watching something or just something because, and it's not that I'm afraid to be with my own mind or Mm -hmm. I don't like the Mm -hmm. noise. I've come to learn how to accept that noise. I've learned to come to accept the information that seeps into my brain and work through those thoughts. And when I need a moment to to let that sink in, I do. Mm -hmm. But I also sometimes will sit there and go, all right, I've been sitting here now for an hour Mm -hmm. watching mindless television. Mm -hmm. I've lost an hour. I could be doing something else. Yeah. So what you're referring to is my time needs to be productive. Yes. And if it's not productive, I've wasted my time. A hundred percent. Yeah. Because also another thing is, remember, capitalism is a religion of the North, yes. North America and Europe as well. And so time is money. And if you're not doing something productive, it doesn't account to money. It's mm-hmm. not a skill. So you got to be c- continuously do something, something, something. Because if you don't, what's wrong with you? Sometimes we hear our parents too, right? And sometimes mm-hmm. I feel like I'm my mom. Tell- I'm, I feel like I'm an older sister, like yelling at you, you know, <laughs> being like, what's wrong with you? Why are you just yeah. sitting there? Do something with your life, <laughs> you know? And it does come out because we hear these things a, a lot as mm. well. And that's the thing. Yes. T- no, time doesn't have to be, time does not equate to money. What it does actually is, let me backtrack. One of the most powerful things I remember years ago I heard was, what does success mean to you? Success actually means to me, that I'm able to get to a place where I have the time to do the things I love, meaning I can pay someone to actually come clean the house regularly. So I can I can build I can buy time for myself. That's success. For, mm-hmm. And, you know, I thought about that and I was like, oh, goals. And, you know, all these years later, I think that's still my top goal of how I define success. It's not X dollars or it's not this and that. It's do I have time to do the things I enjoy so I don't I can afford the luxury of doing the things I enjoy and not doing things like cleaning the toilets and like organizing the kitchen and Mm. finding the lids to the, you know, the boxes. Somebody else can do that. So you have that time. What are you doing with that time? If you're sitting there mindlessly scrolling, doom scrolling or watching Netflix, yeah, you probably did waste that time. Mm -hmm. But that time, because that time's not intentional. So it's about the intentionality. It's about the purpose behind what you're doing in that time. Yeah. A lot of times people, they'll go for a run. And then after that, you've got the runner's high. But then after that, you're still able to kind of sit and reflect. You know, certain things, thoughts come into your mind. In the shower, one of the best places you get the best ideas a lot of times. Or sometimes very problematic ideas, <laughs> if you were me. <laughs> so my showers are in and out. It's yeah. like, no, 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 no. no that no. is too much a long time. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need more problems in my life. So in and out. But that's actually the the art of self-reflection and there's a lot of questions you can ask yourself but the one question i find is so helpful that anybody can start anytime and you know everybody free therapy yeah so take notes be curious about stuff i love that the curiosity thing because when you're curious what you're doing is you're trying to approach it from something from a place of what's going on with me why did i have such a strong reaction my mom said that to me she said cut your hair piss me off why it, most people will go into, oh, she's always making comments. She's never happy. I think I look good, you know, because of all these comments she made. I grew up with like such low self-esteem and body image issues and this and this and this. Before jumping into that part, take a breath, quite literally pause and ask yourself, why did I have such a strong reaction to it? When you start approaching life with a sense of curiosity, you'll be able to better navigate conversations with your partners, with your friends, any relationships, even when it comes to work, challenging questions, because what it's doing is it's giving you an insight into yourself. And the more insight you have into yourself, the better you'll be able to regulate, better you'll be able to navigate. Mm. Following your curiosity, I find, always leads you down a much happier place. 
because you're not as tense about it. And I feel like we've lost our ability to be curious about things because all the information is available to us at the click of a button. Yeah, which is not always a good thing, especially when it comes to the therapy world. I get hit up with, like, you think it's beneficial? And I'm just like, no, you know what? One of the worst things that can happen, my husband, he does this. He'll, He'll probably watch one or two videos somewhere online. He's like, you know, don't try to gaslight me, Sarah. And I was like, boy, sit down. You don't even know what you're talking about. You know, don't try that with me. But that's what it is, is people will learn through this therapy speak. Mm. And I hear it so often when it comes to people using it in conversations. Oh, he's a narcissist. Oh, she's trying to gaslight me. But do you even know what happened? No, somebody disagreeing with you doesn't mean they're gaslighting with you. There's a specific definition of how you define gaslighting. So you do have information at the click of a button. Not always a good thing. No. (laughs) <laughs> um, I got to ask you about when when people are growing up uh, in a household that uh, where there was tension, right? When they see their parents and there's tension between their parents mm-hmm. um, versus growing up in a household where they see affection between their parents. They mm-hmm. see communication between their parents. Mm-hmm. What's the biggest uh, side effect of the two? On the most basic genetic level, you'll notice a body that's more tensed up Hmm. versus a body that's more relaxed. And you can pick up on things very quickly because, like I said, human beings actually, irrespective of race, religion, gender, it doesn't matter. We all have similar responses. That's why you're able to tell when somebody doesn't know anybody, the other person, because body language is a bit more tighter. So the more you're around people, the more you pick up on it. The more you approach it from a sense of curiosity, you can pick up on it. And... When you have a child who's grown up in a household where there's a lot of conflict, and you see this with pets as well, right? Like you bring a new dog or a cat, and there's a certain type of tension in the house. They don't have the language to communicate to you, neither do the babies, but they do know, and they always gravitate towards it. And I'm sure you've heard, you know, somehow kids always know which uncle to go to or auntie to go to, right? Yeah. Why? Because they know it's a specific type of energy, yeah. and they gravitate towards that because they don't have the language, but they do know. So that's similarly, you'll notice that impact of it as you get older you'll notice that you're less confident in yourself because you're so wound up you're more jumpy for lack of a better word things startle you quickly because your nervous system is probably in overdrive because it's so tense you might notice that when you feel so stressed out it leads to other things like a weakened immune system you fall sick more people have more health issues in short stress is basically the cause to everything Mm. and when you grow up in a stressful household it's very likely you'll internalize it and you don't realize that you're internalizing it until you move out, which I know for a fact that you also 100% realize a lot of things about your parents after you moved out. You don't even have to say yes to that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will say yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny because my household was full of tension. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that my parents worked as as long as they did. Yeah. Uh, tiring jobs. It wasn't sit down office type jobs. They were on their feet all day. Yeah. Coming to Canada, learning the new language. Yeah. Leaving their family behind. Mm-hmm. The tension of seeing a civil war unfold in front of their eyes, uh, not being it, being sort of stripped away from all of that, and sort of carrying all that tension coming to Toronto, and then. Yeah, I could. When I moved out, it's funny. The best way I could describe it is quiet. Yeah, it was a lot quieter yeah. when I when I moved out. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, it's funny when I go back to see them, it's always so loud in the house. <laughs> and I'm just like, can you turn on the TV for a little bit? Yeah. Can we just not yell yeah. <laughs> in the house? And yeah. they're like, we're not yelling. Yeah. <laughs> and we laugh and we make jokes about that, but it's yeah. very much something that I've noticed, yeah. I think would be the biggest thing I noticed. You know, Samir, I pray that you get to the day where you go in and you embrace the loudness because there's a certain sense of um, familiarity that comes with it. Mm. The chaos. If you've been to a family wedding, you're just mm. like, oh my God. Why am I here again? But something about it, like once you get to a place of acceptance, and I guess that's what I'm referring to for you, and I pray this day comes inshallah very soon for you, where you get to a place of acceptance where you're just like, if I lived here, I'd probably die in two weeks. But there's something about it in this moment when I look around and I see my mom yelling at my dad who's in the kitchen trying to help her, but he's just driving her nuts. And 
she's yelling at my other cousin, but she's also on the phone with my aunt, on, you know, who's in Beirut right now or whatever <laughs> it is. And she's like yelling at me being like, take garbage out. So and so is coming. There's so much chaos. But if you actually take a moment and try this out next time, take a moment and freeze yourself in that moment and just look around. There's actually so much beauty in that chaos because that's survival for them. Hmm. Hmm, that's interesting. And I do hope you get to a point where you actually start to love it because you'll find humor in it. And the the way things work out with there's so much going on all at the same time, but somehow things fall into place. You're just <laughs> like this. Mm, this is more than just God. Yeah. There's something going on here, <laughs> you know? Well, so when uh, my ex and I split up, I decided I was going to go stay with my parents mm -hmm. for a couple of days. Oh, boy. And that was like a full circle adjustment <laughs> of like just being under their roof again. It was, I yeah. think, maybe three, four days max. But just those three, four days between the emotions of everything else that was happening and then yeah. being under their, their roof again, I literally felt as safe as I could, but also as constricted as mm -hmm. I could feel. Yeah. Because... It reminded me of like the, this is not my, my home. This is someone else's house. Mm -hmm. I'm living by someone else's rules. And mm -hmm. I've grown to love my own independence so much so that I don't sacrifice it for anything. Yeah. Um, but then there was still that safety of being back there during a, a traumatic life moment. Try to explain that to a white therapist. Because I know exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about. And that answers the first question that you asked me. What's the difference between you seeing a white client, let's say, versus a POC client, mm. both of them dealing with anxiety? That's the difference because mm. therapists who don't understand the nuance there will tell you, why would you do that? You know, when you said that to me, I said, ooh, but I knew exactly what was going to come because it's activation of inner child, that little boy who used to live at home, mm. that came out, but also at the same time, that little boy's in an adult body. So... That's what I mean by there's there's intersectionality, you know, and people need to pick up on that, that nuance. They don't understand that. So, of course, you would go to your parents for comfort. What child doesn't? And also at the same time, these are parents who've come from a place of experiencing heavy trauma in their youth. And, you know, they don't know how to navigate that themselves. And how do they give you something they don't even know exists? Yeah. There's that as well. So two things can be true because you went back there because you know that that place, as chaotic, chaotic as it is, it's an immense place of love for you. You know there's like limitless love there. Might not be shown in the most <laughs> lovely ways, but you do know at its yeah. very core. Yeah. And most immigrant kids say that. Yeah. It's shown in not healthy ways. However, we do know that they love us. So you went back there in hopes that you would get a certain type of love and comfort, but that's when you realize you're barking up the tree that doesn't even have that fruit. Mm. Right? It makes perfect sense why you would do that. I think... Most people would do that when they're having a difficult time. I know a lot of friends of mine who have babies. They're like, yeah, you know, I'm going to move in with my mom for the first month till I adjust, helping with cooking and cleaning. And then they, they're like, yeah, you know, the cooking and cleaning, it, it that's helpful, but it's tough. And I'm like, yeah, that's because there's a tax you got to pay with everything, yeah. you know, and this is called the mental health tax. So either I or nanny. and pay someone to do it or you get the free help from your mom. But, you know, comes at a cost. How do we heal the inner child? Oh, boy. Hey, you're asking for my secret sauce. I am. <laughs> <laughs> How do we heal the child inside that's, uh, that we've been taught to, like, just stay yeah. stay over there? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a grown adult <clears throat> now. Yeah. I'm doing big, big boy things now. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm getting a job. I'm yeah. getting a car. I'm getting a house. I'm doing A, B, C, D. Yeah. Ain't nobody have time for, for you know, yeah. your stuff. Yeah. But then that stuff will rear its ugly head yeah. at a moment's notice. Yeah. I mean, if your dad walked unravel. in here right now, you'd probably be like, Salam alaikum, Baba, do you want water? And you'd give him my water. You'd be like, girl, move. My dad's here. Get out of here. You know? Yeah. It happens. It happens. All It'll happen when you're 50. Hmm. It'll happen. So I think a couple of things. One is, I'll give you the Coles Notes version or the chat GPT version. The free, the free chat <laughs> the GPT free version, yeah. not the big one. Um First one is understanding that that inner child is meant to stay. 
mm-hmm. and it'll always come up because you'll always be triggered. You'll always be triggered. There's going to be certain things that's going to trigger you at certain times in, in, in your life. And, you know, I think for a lot of us, seeing what we see in the media right now has been triggering a lot of things for us mm. over the last three months. And it's extremely painful to witness that. I remember all of October, something in me, I felt like there was this deep sense of pain and like loneliness and I couldn't stop crying. And I used to just go to No Frills to buy this bag of $2.50 fries, probably like the cheapest, not even real potato, honestly. (laughs) And I would go to my girlfriend's because she had a killer air fryer to make me feel better so it's not deep fried. (laughs) Drive all the way to Mississauga from Toronto and I'd be like, girl, turn up the air fryer. I'm here to eat fries. (laughs) I'm coming with fries. That's it. That's that's all it was. She's like, I got you. And we used to just sit there and talk about Palestine. Mm. And we would be so, we would feel... Like we were in community, but it was, it was, I was like, this is giving COVID, you know, but, but not, but this is awful, incredibly awful compared to that. But that sense of loneliness, isolation, pain, uncertainty, all of that kept coming back to that degree for me. Mm. And I was just like, oh, I need those fries. And I just wanted to, frankly, what, what comfort What did the fries myself. symbolize? It's comfort, right? It's comfort. And I just wanted to eat. And it was also cold. I just want something nice and crunchy and warm. <laughs> that's it. It's not that deep. <laughs> okay. Okay. Because you put a burger in front of me, I'd eat that too. <laughs> but it's just fries you could eat in abundance for a good yeah, fries. Yeah. The fake fries. So the inner child will always be there. Hmm. You're always going to be triggered. Okay. Something or the other will trigger you at some point in your life. So understanding that uh, that's going to be there. The second thing is, which most people don't realize, your inner child, the best parent to your inner child is you, not your parents. Because what you want from your parents, and this is for me, you, and everybody listening in, they're likely not going to give it to you. Because what you want, there's a very high, I'd even say 99% chance, they don't even have it to give it to you. So how do you expect, no matter how many conversations you have with them, they might try to understand, they might even get to level one, two, and three, but you're in a different league compared to them. They'll never get to the level 16 you're asking for because your lifestyle has been very different. Your resources are very different. Why would they give you something like that when they have had never had any of that? How do we practice patience there? (laughs) Because (laughs) there's moments where growing up, I've wanted more from my father. Yeah. But he couldn't give it to me because he didn't know how to, Mm -hmm. to your point. Mm Mm-hmm. And I had to learn to to seek it and source it elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And it was never, it was like, yeah, that's nice, but it's not, it's not my dad. To, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and there have been times where I've made really stupid decisions and I'm like, man, if I just had, if my dad was able to just pull me aside and say, hey, Samir, don't do this. Mm-hmm. Or if you're going to do this, just think about A, B, and C. The things that I say to myself but I wanted to come from my father. Samir, your dad, your dad's Lebanese. I know. You could have some realistic expectations. <laughs> I know. He's not gonna be like, "Don't do this." It's gonna be a pal. <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but like, it's it, it comes back to like, how do we, how do we? I guess maybe the question I'm asking is, how do we forgive them for the things that yeah. they may not necessarily be at fault for, but that we blame them for? So I'm gonna push back on that question because is it? Well, first of all. To put it very crass, why are you? Why do they even need your forgiveness? Fair, yeah. They, you're asking for something they don't have. So my question actually would be here: <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm on Team Baba Samir for this one, which is, do you even have realistic expectations of him? Hmm. Maybe I don't. Because if you don't, then he doesn't need your forgiveness. He'd be like, boy, sit down. See, it's funny when you say that and I think about that, I go, maybe I don't have realistic expectations, but then I'm like, but that's my dad. My expectations of him should be like, because he's <laughs> and that's capable the problem. of. Your hand is exactly what we all know of. And that's the problem. You put him on a pedestal. We all do because we're also taught that, right? Hmm. They're your parents. You They're know? superheroes. Yeah, exactly. And they are. In many ways, they are. But before they were your parents, they're human beings. And they're deeply flawed. Hmm. So perhaps your expectations of your parents were not realistic. And so when they're not realistic and you're asking for perfection from them, you're frankly dehumanizing them. Interesting. 
He's not perfect. Man went through a war. It's things that he's done and seen that you'll never see, which is a privilege. Because of what he did. Yeah. <laughs> How do we break the generational curse? <laughs> all the tough questions. Did you ask your friends to come together and say, like, give me all the questions? <laughs> all right, I need to know what you, you want to know. <laughs> need therapy? I got your answers coming next week at poker night. Um, one of the best ways to do it is understanding that, hey, you know what? I can't get this from my father. Okay, no problem. Life is not perfect. I think my husband said this a long time ago, and I was like, pro- I was probably upset about, it. honestly, the dumbest shit ever. I don't even know. And he said, listen, Sarah, you live in a perfect world or realistic world. You figure it out. And I was like, oh, I hate that he's right. <laughs> and I love it. I'll never tell him that. No. And hopefully he doesn't watch this part of the episode. <laughs> no, he's a great guy, mashallah. <clears throat> very, like, thoughtful and, you know, very intuitive. And there's a lot of, like, whiz- nuggets of wisdom I picked up from him. Mm-hmm. And that's one of them, which is... You want to be in a realistic world? This is something you have to come to terms with. You know, you decide how you're going to do that. And I hold on to that all these years later because it's true. You want that from your father? Yeah, in a perfect world, in the next life, inshallah, you know? Mm. But now, you're not going to get it. How do you break that so it doesn't get passed to your next generation? Being mindful of that yourself, but also understanding that 100% you're going to drop the ball on other things. Okay. So then you you realize that a lot of some of this is on you you got to take it upon yourself yeah and also you know your parents have broken some generational curses of their own yeah things that their grandparents your grandparents did to them they're just probably like we'll never do this to our kids you just don't know what those things are Hmm. (laughs) it's funny because i i think all the time if i'm fortunate enough to have kids one day the things that i wouldn't do yeah and the things i would do yeah And that's one thing that I see in my clients who are new parents, men, women, it doesn't matter. They try to overcompensate and overcorrect all of their traumas that they have not taken care of. Can we explore that a little more? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) How are they doing that? So, for example, I'll give you, you know what, I'll give you my sister's example and my niece. I don't have children. Elena's the only, you know, kid in my life who's around and she's like my child. Um, My sister... Oh, God. This is like a therapy session about my sister. So my sister, perhaps growing up, felt neglected in a certain type of way, which is weird because if you ask me, between the three of us kids, that girl got the most attention. But you know what? That's a separate story for another day. (laughs) Anytime my niece does something, she gets attention right away. If we're busy and doing something, my sister will be like, hey, Elena's calling you. Can you give her attention? So, sorry, one moment. That's her overcorrecting and trying to make sure every emotional need of her child is met. Now, I don't know what happened. Obviously, my sister has her version of what happened when she was growing up. <clears throat> but I do know is when I see something like that, I know she's trying to overcorrect. Sometimes that also looks like for parents, they'll just buy their kids anything. Hmm. That's how most people typically associate it, is just get them what they want for them to stop crying, to stop you know, yelling in the mall. It's embarrassing, right? Because I grew up in a household where my parents were yelling. Oh, my kid's throwing a tantrum. I never want to see that because people are judging me. Yeah. Because when I was a kid, they were judging my parents. We're judging me because of my parents. We were reflections of them. (coughs) And somehow how we behaved (laughs) meant that they raised us poorly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it happens all the time. Kids actually bring out all of your insecurities. It's the worst. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any, but I don't know why I'm rolling my eyes like I yeah. have six. <laughs> okay. Um, the, so you, the overcorrecting, how does that affect the kid? It, it's clear how it affects yeah. or why we're doing yeah. it. But on the receiving end of that overcorrectness, yeah. does that not create a sense of every desire is going to be met And as they get older, they're Mm -hmm. going to expect that the world will cater to them that way. Let me flip that question on to you. If your father always wanted to be a surgeon Mm -hmm. and he couldn't because let's say his father passed away. So great student, could have been a surgeon, could have been a surgeon if he wanted to, but he couldn't. Life had a different story for him. He had to start working and so on. He's like, finally, my son is born. My son's going to be a surgeon. 
And then everything he does to make sure Samira is put in the best schools of the best of everything and the best food, best brain food, best routine, best mental health, physical health, because he's going to be a surgeon. Excuse me. Do you find that there's no problem with that? That he puts me in like he does all those things? Because he has an agenda, right? He wanted to be a surgeon. He couldn't. Now he's going to make sure his son is set up to be a surgeon. I mean, the obvious answer is if that's not what I wanted, then no, that's not good. But you don't know anything, right? Because at that young age, you're just like, no, this is the best thing ever because my dad's giving me all the attention. I'm going to do all the things that bring me his attention, which includes the best grades. So let's say you do go ahead and get into the best schools and you do become a surgeon. What happens after? I pursue a career that I might not be happy in. Yeah. Chances are you're very likely not going to be happy in it because you haven't explored anything else. So then as the parent, how do you, there's a, obviously there's a good intention there. Mm -hmm. Give them everything I didn't have. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that you're not putting them in in a restrictive box? Like this is what you're going to do. Yeah. It comes down to self-awareness, right? Which is, I understand I didn't have this, 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 but is that going to be in the best interest of the child? May or may not be true because you grew up in a different time, different environment, different circumstances. A lot of us millennials <clears throat> not sure I think you're a millennial I'm gonna go with that just because I feel better about it <laughs> a lot of us millennials we want to buy a house yeah our parents are like buy property save money save money buy yeah. property just before coming in got here early and I was looking at just the co- I don't know why I did it to like ruin my mood really that's <laughs> that's probably why I was so sweating when I came in because I was <laughs> angry I was livid <laughs> looking at these prices and I was like this box Insane. for like 700,000 sit down you know a box sit. in the sky <laughs> awful not even nice you know everything is this is it this was the apartment for 700,000 it's probably bigger so when you're just like I need a house I need a house because that's security for me what they're realizing is I might be able to get a house but I'm you know asset rich cash poor mm-hmm. and I need cash for everything else literally everything else and we're not talking about luxury we're just talking about basic basic groceries go out to a friend's birthday go watch a movie basic things you know and that's where we run into problems so yes they have the best of intentions but the best of intentions doesn't mean it's the best for us so checking yourself to see like is this even fair for me to talk to my kid about it Hmm. and what does that look like i always imagine putting my hypothetical kids into like every sport Mm-hmm. I grew up watching hockey. Yeah. I love hockey. Yeah. There's things about hockey that I don't really like anymore these days. Yeah. Um, and then also the price of hockey. Yeah. <laughs> and I kept thinking to myself, okay, well, maybe I would start to put them into other sports as well. Yeah. Give them the option to choose what they enjoy. Yeah. And when I've spoken to athletes, they've talked about how the fact that their parents put them into multi-sports mm-hmm. actually allowed them to love mm-hmm. the sport that they excelled in. Mm-hmm. I imagine it's kind of the same approach, but to everything else in life. Yeah. So if you have a one track mind, what you're doing is you're actually taking away the options that the kids have. Hmm. You also have to study your children as though they are. Yes, they're a part of you, but they're also not in the sense that they might have likes and want to explore certain things that we're not going to be doing. My niece, for example, Elena, that girl loves she was born twerking. I don't know how. I don't know how. (laughs) Nobody's taught her a dance step like that. To the point where anytime she sees my dad, she doesn't. We're like, yo, you got to stop. Like, <laughs> you're six. It's still fine, you know. But like in two years, girl, like stop. <laughs> my mom, she's like, no dance class, no music, haram, this, that. She's going to go into the bad groups of people and this. And I was like, mom, relax, like relax, okay? Like she's young, whatever. She's just having fun. And I'm sure she does it because she sees, she gets a kick out of it. Yeah. She sees everybody she gets reacting, the reaction, exactly, yeah. you know. So it's, it's innocent. It's fine. But... What you want to do is like, and none of us are like that. None of us, me, my cousins, nobody I've grown up with has had any musical inclination. (laughs) Frankly, I think my husband like is the closest one. He knows how to play guitar because he learned off of YouTube (laughs) when he didn't have, when he got fired and depressed at home for a couple months. That's it. That was it. You know? And so I was like, what happened to this kid? Even on our dad's side as well. But what you want to do is you would you want to make sure you're not in that one-track mind. And when you're not in that one-track mind and you actually are trying to study your child, going approaching from a place of curiosity, what's happening is you're like, okay, you know what? Maybe I should put her 
And I did tell her, I told my sister, I was like, put her in dance classes if she's really interested in it because it helps build so much community. I was like, make sure you put her in Bollywood dance classes. So she actually builds community with other South Asian kids. Just she's, people she could relate to. Yeah, yeah, you know, because they're like, when you don't have that relational community, especially related, like ancestral relational community, mm -hmm. you feel there's a part of you that's disconnected, you know? And whether you're just like, no, the butter chicken doesn't cut it for me, you know? And frankly, if you ask me, it's not a real dish. But <laughs> <clears throat> that's, again, another story for another day. But you do need that sense of community. And if you look at all the research where people have lived the longest, I don't know if you've watched Blue Zones on Netflix. No, but I've heard good things. One of the things that shows up in every single one, I didn't watch all of the episodes, but I'm pretty sure, I'm like 100% sure it's going to show up in every single episode, um, every single region, it was community. They all had community. Even if diets weren't great, they all had community. Have you read The Outliers? No. Okay, great book. Um, that's also another thing they read. They, they were doing, sorry, in the book, they talked about doing research as to why certain community in a certain part of the world just lives so much longer. And they, they were like, was it their food? Was it the fact that it was hilly and they were walking up and down? No, it was community. Matter of fact, they were actually overweight compared to the neighboring town. Wow. Lots, yeah but it was community. There is so much strength in community and that's why I said put her in Bollywood but put her also in all the other dance classes that she likes as well because that way she can actually make a mix of friends diver like a diverse group of friends that she gets from every place. Is our community today fractured? Our broad community not individual clusters yeah. of ethno communities yeah. but just our broad community here in yeah. Canada. I think so. It feels fractured, doesn't it? It is. It very, it's very fractured. Especially and coming out of the pandemic. I was just about to say, and I saw it actually in the pandemic, how lonely it is. And they say, right, like we are the loneliest generation and more and more people are spending time indoors, especially when you can do this for six hours and not realize. And then you live in uh, the highlight reel of someone else's life. Yeah. It's easy to get lost. Easy. It's easy to then feel more anxious and depressed. Feel like you haven't done anything with your life. Yeah. Just watch netflix for an hour mm -hmm. i mean <laughs> i'm in that productive. i'm in that space every day yeah and even i still feel like no matter how much i do it's not enough yeah i can't compare and then yeah. there's imposter syndrome that creeps in yeah. and goes well then what are you doing like, yeah no one's paying attention yeah and then i take a moment realize now i'm looking for validation externally how do i pull that back and then when I sit with myself internally, I go, I'm not working hard enough. <laughs> and yeah. then, then like that cycle just starts yeah. right again. So you're oscillating in the black and white. Yeah. Right? You want the validation externally, just post a thirst trap. But yeah. Mr. GQ, I see you. <laughs> Your video's looking good. <laughs> Mashallah, I have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> but then the opposite side too, when you pull back, you're just like, well, I didn't get enough likes. And then, mm. but then the imposter syndrome kicked in or like, do I look weird? You know, like got double chin. This is something, you know, everybody has a version of it, right? I'm just like, oh, my God, I got, like, four chins stuck under my job over here. I've gotten to a point where I'm like, whatever, something's going to stick out from somewhere. I Frankly, I don't care. As long as my shirt, which this is the most shocking part, I have not dropped anything. <laughs> I'm happy. Congrats. Everything else, you know what? It's all good. So it, it does. You keep oscillating. And that's mm. actually the narrative that majority of people will tell you. Maybe they might not admit it to you. Maybe they need, you know, some liquid courage to actually spill it all out, being like, bro, my life sucks. <laughs> But that's that's where I would say a huge majority of people sit. See, uh, I'm constantly on this journey of trying to, to be as authentic as I possibly can yeah. for myself. And so sometimes when I am creating the content, I'm just like, who cares? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. who cares? Yeah. Like, I'd rather be having an authentic, genuine conversation with another yeah. human being right now. Yeah. And I feel that fractured that fracture between all of us is just magnified. Mm -hmm. And whether it's, you know, the pandemic that exasperated a problem that already was, existed and made it worse, or coming out of the pandemic, feeling like everything is normal and going about our days and distracting ourselves, like we didn't just live through that for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And now topping on top of all of that, how our communities are just fractured even further, whether yeah. it's, political beliefs, religious beliefs, policy, whatever, anything. And I don't know, I don't know how we get out of that. I still go back to the thing I said. I think it's tough to do that in North America. It really is. But does that mean there's no hope here? 
big question. And, you know, I want to say I'm a sucker for it. There's a word, uh, there's a saying in Urdu which says, Umid bi dunya gumti, and that means like the world spins on hope. Um, so I am hopeful. I am hopeful that people are going to be more aware of things. People are going to realize like how it actually takes a toll because it does take a toll on your body. Yeah. You know, I'm sure you feel it as well where when your head is caught in that specific like mindset of like oscillating between, well, not good enough, even worse, even worse. You probably notice like you feel more tightness in the chest. Mm-hmm. The workouts might not be so good that day, yeah. you know? Sometimes I find myself sitting in the gym for half an hour. Yeah. I haven't lifted a weight. You're more bloated. You're more like, it's just insides feel more inflamed. Mm-hmm. Funny enough, a lot of people don't even know what that looks like. You know, they don't realize, oh, wow, that's bloating. I just thought I had a gut. I mean, we all have a gut. Yeah. But there's a difference between bloating and, yeah. and you know, what a gut is. Yeah. <clears throat> and so people people don't realize that because they're not aware. They don't pause to sit and reflect and think, what is going on in my body? Wow, I've been lactose intolerant all this time or I've been da- dairy intolerant all this time. I just thought this is how people live. And when you're not <laughs> pausing to stop and think, how are you going to know? So... <laughs> I feel I have like 10 questions to go through <laughs> and we're coming up on time. So I'm going to ask you this one. Okay. What's a piece of advice you would give people listening to this, watching this going, yeah. I resonate with all of this. Yeah. I want to become more self-aware. I want to be able to sit with myself, yeah. get more in tune with my body, see how I'm actually feeling about mm-hmm. my life, the things around me, the relationships, all of that. Yeah. I don't know where to start. Yeah. I don't have the tools. I've never been equipped or taught how to even begin all of this this is my first foray into all yeah. this and it's very intimidating yeah how do i start first thing i would say is get a specific book and you write down your questions and write in it a lot of times like people, a journal like a journal okay a lot of times pe- people don't like that word because they're like oh i'm not like that journal guy. try t- selling a journal to a dude so be like oh, no it's i don't journal. hey i journal it's fantastic <laughs> there's not a lot of guys who do that like you or even you know try to have authentic conversations the way you do you know i'm sure in the space you'll notice that people try to have a certain type of friend mm. right and it's just we do it we mask we all do it um so sure a journal or a book where you want to write down certain things and the reason why you want to write down things is when you actually write you're going to reflect more versus i'm just going to sit here and think because you know what else is happening in your brain the 6,000 other thoughts that you've been thinking about. Maybe I should do this. Maybe I should invest in this. Maybe I should just move to live Vietnam. Life is cheaper there. Or maybe I should do this, this, this. Along with that, plus your journal thoughts, no, 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 no. Too big of a mess. So write the questions down. And this is the thing I always tell everybody. And you know, my friend always makes fun of me. She's like, girl, maybe you should try to push your clinic. By the way, shout out to my clinic, Lena, shameless plug in here. <laughs> um, She's like, why do you keep promoting chat GPT? They don't pay you nothing. And I'm like, you know what? Because AI is hot these days. People love it. Sure. Use things that you easily access and you're there on those pages anyway. Yeah. Google up or just go to chat GPT and type in, I want to become more self-aware. Where do I start? Simple as that. It's a great question to ask AI. <laughs> <laughs> How do I become yeah. self-aware yep. AI? <laughs> yeah, honestly. And it'll give you a whole lot of things. And then you take those topics, paste them in, say, what question should I ask myself? How mm. can I understand my body better? You know? And yeah. so really reading and also reflecting on the content of like what's being asked of you. There's a lot of questions that are there. As you said, there's a wealth of information that's there online. It gets overwhelming because you're like, who's right, who's wrong? I don't know. But that's Okay. Just go on to chat GPT and ask these questions to start off with because the chat GPT will say, you know what? This is a journey, blah, blah, blah. I'll give you its fluff. But mm-hmm. then in the middle, I'll give you a couple questions to start off with, especially when you haven't started off with everything or anything. Sorry. And, you know, it's the exact same process that you would do if you're looking to start a podcast. What's the first thing you're going to do? So it's almost breaking it down into very simple steps. Smart goals. Yeah. Always. Instead of trying to con, instead of trying to conquer this one big thing, yeah, small little goals that it, you can. If you go to the gym as somebody who works out, and you ask a trainer, "Listen, I want to sign you up." Trainer is going to be like, "What's your goal?" You're going to say, "Well, six months I want to have, you know, seven percent body fat. I want so and so. In six months, I want to have six pack." Mm-hmm. What's a trainer going to say? It's not going to happen overnight. You it's not going to happen overnight, mm-hmm. and it's only not just going to happen from working out. 
So even well, if right, you're working out. The diet. Yeah. There's your sleeping habits. There's yeah. your stress. There's all those other things. Yeah. yeah. A lot of other things. Plus also, um, one thing that some trainers might not bring up with you is what does your genetic makeup look like? Because if you look at South Asian men, for example, and diabetes studies are done heavily on South Asian men, their body types are certain a certain way. They actually hold their weight on their stomach. Hmm. And if you look back, go back to some generations ago, South Asian bodies actually experienced two famines. And what happened is the body actually trained to store its fat around the stomach region in case there's a new one coming up hmm. just to survive. So South Asian men, generally speaking, if you have any South Asian uncles, all it'll you know, they got a belly, skinny legs. It's usually what happens. So that also plays a That's role. Interesting. Yeah. That also plays a role. So you can watch your diet. You can do this. You can do that. You can do that. But your genetic makeup is a certain type of way. And it's not going to change. Hmm. Which I think is kind of a nice point to, to remind yourself of when you feel like you've done all the other things right. Yeah. And you still don't see that six pack. Yeah. That sometimes there is a factor that's outside of your control. Yeah. You can't control. You can control what you eat. You can't control how many, how many hours of sleep you get, how often you work out. Yeah. Huh. And that's a conversation we have a lot with new moms mm. who actually have gone through substantial changes in their bodies, hormonal changes. And you're not going to bounce back. It doesn't matter if Beyonce looked like that a month after. That's Beyonce. <laughs> she got a whole lot of things we don't have, you know? <laughs> It doesn't matter. Yeah. You're not you're not going to look like that, period. It doesn't matter what you do. If your physique was very tiny growing up, it doesn't matter. None of it matters. Because you're not being realistic of what your genetic makeup is, your lifestyle changes, your hormonal changes, which frankly, you don't even know what's happening inside the way things change in women's bodies. That's a very interesting conversation that I think we need to do a part two on. Because <laughs> I'm also right. very curious about what role men can play to support their partners better. Oh, I got a lot to say. Yeah. Over there, so so that's back. definitely a part two. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank this you. This was wonderful. This, uh, <laughs> the time flew by, unfortunately, but uh, learned a ton. I'm and glad. I think you do incredible work. I think it's super important work. I am glad that you offer people a sense of comfort, that they feel that there is a place that they can go to and a person that they can speak to that understands them at a I don't know what the word is, inherently understands them better. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very important, and I commend you on all of that. Oh. Please continue. Thank you. You're so kind. Thank you. Thank you so and much. And the kids call it vibe check. She passes the vibe check. You've we'll passed the vibe yeah, check. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, everybody, for listening.